welcome you all for this uh, program on the scientific heritage and culture and professor narsimha especially has been very helpful for us right from the days of the inception of this planetarium 30 years ago he was the member of the governing council at that time and he has uh, given us very good guidance uh, for our activities here and uh, his concern for education is very well known Uh, you may be aware of the journal called Resonance, which was uh, initiated by him when he was the president of the Indian uh, Indian Academy of Sciences. Now, Professor Rodham Narsimha is an Indian aerospace scientist who was professor of aerospace engineering at the Indian Institute of Science from 1962 to 1999, director of the National Aerospace Laboratories 1984 to 1993 and Chairman of Engineering Mechanics Unit of Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research, Bangalore, from 2000 to 2014. He was also Director of the National Institute of Advanced Studies. That's when I got to know him, when I got to know him well. And I've held him in very high esteem ever since. He is now DST Year of Science Chair, Professor at the Center, and also holds the Pratt and Whitney Chair in Science and Engineering at the University of Hyderabad. He was awarded the Padma Vibhushan in 2013. Professor R. N. Iyengar, a civil engineer, was at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, for almost four decades. From 1994 to 2000, he was director of the Central Building Research Institute in Roorkee. He's currently director, Center for Dis Disaster Mitigation at Jain University, Bangalore, and editor of Sadhana, published by the Indian Academy of Sciences. He has held visiting professorships at Purdue University and Brooklyn, Brooklyn Polytechnic and the Florida Atlantic University. Astronomy really is the first branch of mathematical physics that human beings started studying. What you may call mathematical physics. It was not called that at that time. But quite often astronomy was encouraged for reasons that uh, um, Ambassador Nazareth described. But it also became the trigger for the development of a lot of mathematics. which then went on to do all kinds of other things in the world. Now, um, one question which always intrigues us, and especially in a country like India, is this. Has science always been the same? Has it varied in character? Does science mean the same thing to one culture as it does to other cultures, for example? Did science mean the same thing to the Greeks and to the Indians? Did they both go about it the same way or did they have different ways? Did they exchange exchanges of thinking or were they isolated? How has this happened? Have things disappeared? The Greek civilization disappeared? But India has not. So, I want therefore to discuss that kind of question. And what I will do in fact uh, is keeping going in and out of these questions. Uh, well, things have changed. We are talking about a history going back more than 2,000 years. So things have changed over that interval. And it's nice to see the kind of, uh, what I think, cycles uh, that have occurred in the history of science. And epistemology is, of course, the way that you do your science, what you consider important and how you do it. And the two are related. In different societies, different cultures, there may be different ways of looking at the subject. Ah, oh, sorry. Well, I have here a picture I took from uh, Professor Fritz Stahl, but modified it somewhat. While you were at the National Institute of Advanced Studies, very often we used to meet quite frequently when I was in Nias. Uh, but, um, well, after I left, it became very rare. And so the other day, just a few, a couple of weeks ago or so, a week or two ago, I was very pleased to meet Ambassador Nazareth once again. 
at the uh, NIAS. Well, uh, I don't know if you were there when Professor Fritz Stahl was a guest of ours at NIAS. Fritz Stahl, uh, he's actually, he's actually uh, um, by birth Dutch, but eventually became an American citizen. Uh, he got his PhD in India. He was very interested in Sanskrit. He also got a PhD uh, in um, UK. Then he eventually was, spent some time in Holland, but went back, became a professor at Berkeley. Last I knew, he was living in Thailand because he liked the climate <laughs> and wanted to be quiet. Well, this is an interesting uh, chart. It starts with um, Mesopotamia, okay, sort of what we would now today call the Middle East, let's say, 3000 BC. Indian, he says, India and China, he says, are after 1000 BC. Well, uh, after 1000, but there were some ideas already earlier in certain fields. So, but, uh, but by and large, so that's 3000 years ago. And then there was the Greek, after about 600 BC, that was about the time of Pythagoras. I come back to Pythagoras again. Then, uh, there was the Arab thing, around 700 AD, reached its peak, I'd say around 1100, 200, for a few hundred years. It was uh, the, what do you call, it was the place where knowledge was exchanged between three neighboring civilizations as far as the Arabs were concerned. From China, in the old Silk Route, from India, well, just across uh, what today is Afghanistan and so on. Persia is already there, and then uh, the Arabs. Greek, well, you see, Greek science had become very weak by 700. Um, but the Greeks were nearby. There's a Greek empire on the other side, so there was something from Greeks. And then Hellenistic, which is sort of the culture of uh, Greece and so on, but maybe Alexandrian, for perhaps, and uh, also in that uh, Greek empire. European is pretty recent from one point of view, if you forget about Greece. Uh, European science is actually relatively recent, 1500. So only about 400, 500 years, that's all. 300, 400 years, it's not, not, not very old. But um, the two civilizations, which have survived all those years, I think, are India and China. We started very early, and we're still there. Well, we're probably not quite the same knowledge powers as uh, we used to be, let's say, three or 400 years ago. Even as recently as 400 years ago, the Indians didn't think they could learn anything from the Europeans. But um, the last 400 years have, in fact, been uh, not very productive uh, centuries in India. But on the other hand, Europe was unproductive from the time of Greece. Well, let's say 1000, uh, let's say uh, maybe 200 AD. 200 AD was, um, what's his name? Ptolemy. After Ptolemy's book, till Copernicus and Kepler, and later on uh, Descartes and Newton and so on, there was no science from Europe. Only theology. Huh? Only theology. Only theology, that's right. They were the dark ages in Europe. So from one point of view, at the end of those 1200 years, they really didn't know, hadn't, hadn't, hadn't produced any science. So I asked some of my friends who don't believe it, please name for me one great European scientist between 200 and 1400 AD. Very difficult. Well, unfortunately, the same thing has happened in India too. If I ask you to name a great Indian scientist from, let's say, 1500, 1500, 600, to let's say 1,900 uh, or even later. It will be very hard for us. So we've been through a dark ages as well. So let's remember that. 
Maybe we will get out of it faster than the Europeans did. Well, what I'm going to do is to talk about some of these links. And in particular, I, I want to say something about the Greek method of doing science and the Indian method of doing science. What were their views about how to go about it? Was it common? Was it inspired the same way? Or did it have different methods? Well, <coughs> um, oh, well, I think I forgot one thing, which is very important. There is this uh, one line going from 1000 BC all the way to here. <laughs> that line is linguistics. Now, linguistics, uh, well, uh, the theory, the rules of language, and the study of languages, has, uh, has been studied um, very thoroughly in India. In fact, you can say that India was ahead in linguistics over the rest of the world till 1800. 18, till 1800, linguistics was not a major, major interest in Europe. But it was only when the British came here and found out in 1800 what an extraordinary kind of uh, uh, system there was in Sanskrit, going back to Panini's times, 500 BC. Oh, those, uh, they, they were astonished at the way that uh, it was so systematized and that you have a finite number of rules. I've forgotten the precise number, 4,937. <laughs> Panini said, this is the whole grammar of Sanskrit. Now, language has an effect on the way we do it. And that's why I want you to see that link, which has been continuous in India for now 3,000 years. So, wh wh how did uh, Indians think about all of this? Uh, I, I don't want to go into details here at all. So I will go through this quickly. The Aryabhatiya is a very good example to look at. Well, it's the first great book on astronomy in India. And it has had a profound effect on the way that astronomy was done in this country for a very long time. And even today, there are, there are things that, uh, from the nature of the Aryabhatiya, we can see what the thinking was like. It's a thinking which, therefore, you could almost say, began from him. It was not entirely new, but uh, he did such a wonderful job that it has uh, had a profound effect on our uh, scientific thinking. Start with a short, short invocation to Brahma, writing numbers. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the first chapter. It's called uh, Gitika. Now, uh, Gitika is the meter. It's, it's uh, nothing to do with uh, anything else. It says, well, these verses are all written in the same meter. The ages, planetary orbits, Earth's rotation, the epicycles, most probably coming from the Greeks, sign differences, the trigonometric sign. But um, when you read it, uh, the first chapter is about the numbers that he is going to take for his calculations. What are the initial conditions? When can I say all this started? 4.3 million years ago. And what were the numbers? And how do you, through the mathematics that I'm going to describe, how do you predict what is going to happen now? That was the, that was the spirit in which this was written. Um, I want to give you one example about the science, because I see that there are young people here who I'm sure know trigonometry. Well, this is, this is, why, this is the thing in Canada. This verse is a table of science. I mean, first it seems surprising. Uh, this I picked up in Mysore. Here that is in um, Sanskrit. And I've written down its uh, pronunciation here down below in English. And it's a funny verse. Maki, baki, paki, dhaki. And you say, what is this now? What has this got to do with trigonometry? But it's actually the science. But it is very cleverly done. Uh, first of all, it's only science between 0 and 90 degrees, which itself is, was big progress. Because if you took uh, looked at Ptolemy's book, I come back to Ptolemy a little later, uh, the Greek astronomer, um, he doesn't do it from 0 to 90 degrees. It's only the card of the circle. 
So this is limited to 0 and 90 degrees, but it's actually not the value of the sines. He wants to economize. It's the value of the first differences between successive sines. So that way you have smaller numbers, and you can work up the sign from um, starting at uh, 0. Well, it's correct to the fourth place. Now those words there all are uh, very peculiar. I won't go into the details of that system at all. How very compactly you can produce four-digit numbers. So you can see that it was uh, very clever, at least. <coughs> it was an ingenious system. Introduce the sign as defined today, only 0 to 90 degrees and only differences. And if you read it, I couldn't help feeling when I first came across it some 25, 30 years ago, clever, playful, terse, deep, unfussy, and business like that. That's, that's what you see. <clears throat> well, then there is Ganita, which we normally translate in India as mathematics. But really, Ganita is calculation with numbers. Uh, there may be other parts of mathematics, you see. But Ganita in India, so that shows that in India, calculation was mathematics. Just as I tell you in a short while, in uh, Greece, it's almost that, uh, the other way. Logic was actually mathematics. So there was already a difference in view, you can see, between the role of these things. So it tells you how to square, take cube, square roots, cube roots, etc. But no models. No models in the sense in which the Greeks would use the word. And I'll also tell you what the Greek model for the universe was. But uh, the Indian things are not there. They're, they're not talking too much about models. They're talking all about calculations. How do you predict this? How do you predict the position of the planets and so on? Then, uh, there's of course a well-known theorem which we attribute to Pythagoras. Actually, they, they say, I keep reading about Pythagoras in the newspapers every time. Some meeting or the other, Science Congress, somewhere else, in Bombay, for example. Uh, there was a session on the history of science. And there was all kinds of science discussed, which actually were, well, it was not well done, to tell, tell you the truth. But a session on the history of Indian science is actually necessary. But it must be well thought out science, well examined science, not just anything which comes to your mind. Now, somebody made a statement there uh, that the theorem of Pythagoras was known to the Indians before him. And all the newspapers, of course, made a big attack on him, saying, you know, what rubbish. But it's not changed, even though it's, no, it's not changed. But actually, it's true. Now, it's, well, the truth is very strange. And for some reason, it's not widely recognized yet. There was a German scholar who, about the 1970s, after a long study of all the literature available, came to the conclusion that Pythagoras had nothing to do with the theorem named after him. <laughs> <laughs> he was not, first of all, much of a mathematician. He had a large number of uh, students, disciples, and colleagues, and so on. None of them ever mentioned this. It was first mentioned at a meeting of the Senate, the political Senate. So it was a political thing, actually, where Cicero said, Pythagoras, who invented this theorem. But uh, in all those years, Nobody had actually attributed it to Pythagoras. The really brilliant man in Greek science of that time was Euclid. And Euclid's book is what we have used even to this day to learn geometry. <coughs> so, so there were a lot of these things that uh, was done from the rule of uh, three to summing series and uh, linear indeterminate equations and so on. Well, there was the reckoning, there were chapters, there were four chapters about reckoning time, the celestial sphere, a total of some 50 or 60 algorithms throughout the book. And it's had a lasting influence on Indian astronomy. <clears throat> well, I'll now skip uh, about a thousand years. A thousand years later, um, a thousand years later, astronomy Astronomy as a subject where you were still doing, you were still improving things, you were still making progress, was confined almost entirely to Kerala. 
and uh, an extraordinary school. Unfortunately, not known widely elsewhere in India for quite some time. Um, grew in that little corner of this country, southeast corner. It must have had something to do with the political situation as it changed over the rest of the country. 1500, already parts of India were in, uh, in the hands of Muslims. But um, Madhava was the man who set up that school. It's only a small area, but it, um, but it grew extraordinarily and did many, many very novel things. Natu Agama Moolam. Okay, all of this comes from Yukti, human intelligence. These are products of human intelligence. This is what you think. This is what you do. Doesn't come from some scripture. And you see again and again, the greatest Indian mathematicians wanted to make sure that it was not directly connected to God or theology and so on. I'll give you some examples as I go along. Now that at first may come as a surprise because as you said, we use this constantly for religious functions. And the output of astronomy is what determines when you actually do some puja, for example. But at the same time, the same people, when they wrote their astronomical books, did not appeal to God or to religion. That is, that is an extraordinary thing. So he says, he, he explicitly says, see, not to Agamemnon, it does not come from does not come from uh, any scriptures. Furthermore, um, Neil Kantra reports, they were already by his time, this is about thousand years after, uh, almost exactly thousand years after Raj Bhatta. There have been many Siddhantas in this country. Some actually with foreign influence. You see there is a Romasha here, Polisha here is sort of Greek, this is sort of Roman, there is Yusuri Siddhanta, Vasishta, and so on. Now he actually ranks them, which is the most accurate one. And what is number one, two, three? Well, as listed by Varah Mehra in the 6th century, this was the order, but here this was the order. Okay, it was different. Polisha had come way down, Surya remained at the same place. This different Siddhantas become mutually discrepant. They don't give the same answer. So we have to make new Siddhantas. Siddhantas have to be improved. New Siddhantas have to be made. Now this once again is something I want you to remember. Uh, the Indian astronomers of that time knew that things would be changing in whatever procedure you had. Because not everything is accurate or the world is changing. The universe is changing. They were quite used and quite uh, you know, not uncomfortable with the idea that the universe may be changing. But if you ask the Greeks, if you ask Plato, Plato would say, no, the universe is known once and for all <laughs> when they've done it. Uh, so you can see how, how different these views are. So I said a new Siddhanta must be created. This cannot be ridiculed in this world punished in the other. He's, he's telling his colleagues, don't be afraid to change things. Well, and these are the sources of knowledge. Actually, his book is very interesting to read. Um, he had a school of his own. About all that's unknown, only Pariksha can yield you knowledge. Observation. Number one is observation. In his school, all his students were first taught to learn to observe. Before, before there was any theory, any mathematics, learn to observe. And um, they have to be careful observers. And knowledge, sorry again, is inference. Okay? How do you get this knowledge? You infer it from your observations and from using whatever mathematics you know. That is the way to go about it. So, here were the basic principles uh, that Indian astronomers, you can say Indian scientists follow. Observation and inference. Or you want the Sanskrit version, Pratyaksha and Anumana. Anumana is not uh, suspicion as we use it in Kannada. <laughs> Anumana is inference. Okay. Uh, from, from the data you have, what would you, what would you conclude? Now, what were the Greeks like? I now go back to the Greeks. 
Uh, let's go to Ptolemy. Ptolemy was about the last, last great astronomer and scientist in uh, Greece. He also has a book, which, as you can say, is a kind of position in uh, Greece uh, that Aryabhata had here, with one big difference. Aryabhata has kept to be used for a thousand years with all kinds of improvements, changes, and so on. Ptolemy's was the final, the final word. It was, there was not much more that happened after Ptolemy's book. Now, his book is fat. It's, it's a big book, whereas, uh, whereas uh, Aryabhata's book was 121 slokas. All of this was in 121 slokas. Ptolemy's book is quite fat. It starts with book one. Book one is full of axioms, statements, and assumptions mean. Okay? And what he's going to do over the rest of the book. And uh, arguments, hypotheses, and so on. He also has trigonometrical information, but the card tables, they're not sign tables. They do not uh, sign that way. And then there's book six on eclipses, others on stars, geometric models, epicycles, and so on. Well, the Greeks had a very strong feeling for what you may call beauty. Now, Greek scholars or English scholars in Greek say, you know, the word beauty that the Greeks used, uh, don't use it in the same sense as uh, what you use it in English. But even in spite of that, let's keep that in mind, that beauty was for them, beauty, perfection and so on, was for them very important. So circles, perfect circle, circle is one of the most beautiful curves for people like Plato. Well, it's equally distant from that point. It's just one curve. It's a beautiful thing. Same, similarly, sphere. So they, they had that kind of a feeling for beauty. And um, spherical shells, they had a model. You see, if you, if, you, if you look at Indian astronomy, you can't always find a model. There, there have been some models hidden in some way. But for the Greeks, the universe was known. The universe, they had an assumption for what the universe was like. It's one sphere, okay? Finite size. Uh, they did not think of it as infinite. If you had asked the Indians, they would have said it's infinite. We don't know where it ends. But the Greeks would have said it's one finite sphere. And the orbits, they would have preferred the orbits to be circles. But unfortunately, they were not. They were actually somewhat elliptic, as we would call it. So they had to invent epicycles. But even epicycles had to have only circles, small circles going on large circles. Otherwise, they would say this is not beautiful. So anyway, they made epicycles. And then they said, um, well, the Earth is at the center, and all these planets and the sun are moving around. They assumed it was geocentric. And furthermore, as these planets uh, move around, um, well, they did introduce a certain eccentricity. Um, where were these planets moving? Well, in empty space, is what the Indians would have said. But you see, the Greeks did not believe in empty space. Aristotle, their big guru in all of this, said, nature abhors vacuum. One of his, one of his major, major uh, principles. So how can it be? If it abhors vacuum, it can't be empty there. So they said it is filled with material. But if it's filled with material, how to look at that planet? Well, so it's filled with transparent material. So, but then, you see, you can't fill just fill it with transparent material because the planets are going around at different speeds. So they said, no, each planet is planted in a spherical shell of transparent crystal, and the crystals are, and the shells are are sliding over each other because they have different speeds. Well, that seems like a complicated uh, thing, but that to them that was a that was a beautiful version of what the universe was like. They did make calculations, but a lot of them was inspired from the Babylonians. Then, in 1577, one of these comets, which was observed by Tycho Brahe, had an orbit 
which cut across these other orbits of the planets. So, that model of the Greeks that it said, this is a <laughs> crystal shells, immediately collapsed. Because if it had done that, that would have broken. The crystal would have broken if the comet went through that way. So, after that, Europe changed. Okay, there is some change needed in the way that we look at astronomy. And of course, Copernicus showed that it was the sun was there, and Ptolemy's model was virtually abandoned. Well, okay, I won't go through this in detail. Aryabhata, of course, also in his chapter, um, there are no hypotheses, but uh, there are basically initial conditions given. Once again, this is important. Some kind of initial conditions for you to make calculations is given. Now, the objective in Indian sciences, in the Indian astronomy, was always was, was, was stated in these terms. You have Druk, which is what you see, observation, evidence from your eyes, so to speak. And then there's Ganita, which is uh, mathematics, actually calculation. You must add Druk and Ganita together. And Druk Ganita Ikya is when they're the same. What you see is what your calculation gives you. Or what your calculation gives you is what you see. And that leads to a Siddhanta, then namely the conclusions are prepared and ready now. And that was that was the Indian Indian thing. Now that was very different from what the Greeks said. Um, Plato said a brilliant geometer would be able to figure out everything about astronomy sitting alone in his room if he was bright enough. <laughs> you did not even need to make observations. Observations did not get the first priority there. Computation, Ganita, was also not a very important part. Logic was for them more important than calculation. Well, they did have to make calculations, so they could not avoid it. But their uh, system of numerals was like the Roman system of numerals, except the alpha, betas, displaced uh, a, b's, and so on. Well, the Greek and Indian epicycles, uh, the Indians did not mind I think the Indians did learn epicycles from the Greeks, so you must give them credit for it. But I think that the Indians did not, it didn't have to be perfect figures for the Indians. It, it, well, anything which would work best in your calculations is okay. Now, we go now, another period after Newton and so on, how all happened. Now we are, let's say, in uh, around uh, 1800. Now, around 1800, well, it was already a couple of centuries after the Kerala school. Around 1800, we were beginning to be a British colony. Uh, there were, well, 1799, Tipu was defeated and killed. And um, the power over India began to spread. And uh, they began to learn Sanskrit in Calcutta and other places. They wanted to find out what the Indians knew. John Playfair, a professor at Edinburgh, uh, was one of the first to look at, uh, in English, at uh, the astronomy, Indian astronomy. He learned it from the Brahmins, so he called it the astronomy of the Brahmins. Uh, it's actually a very interesting paper to read. He is astounded. He, the results are from uh, Indian astronomy are shown to him. He is astounded at the accuracy of what the Indians had. They said, much nearer the truth than Ptolemy was. Because Ptolemy had not changed for all those years. But the Indian predictions were much better than Ptolemy. Amazingly, they are in agreement with what Lagrange has just done. You see, this is now <laughs> 1790. Observations made in India when all of Europe was barbarous, so he admits that, <laughs> are uninhabited. And those made in Europe 5,000 years afterwards come in mutual support. How is it that the Indians 5,000 years ago had these things? Of course, he was exaggerating. He didn't know that it was 5,000 years ago. And the, uh, Laplace, what Laplace has done recently, it agrees with what Laplace has done recently. They, they said, he is amazed. So he said, what could be the reason? Was it just chance? Coincidences, that all of them are coincidences? So 
he he collect he he, he computes nine different parameters in all of them the indians do better are there just chance or it could it be true that some ages ago there are there is a newton among the brahmins he rules that out as well um, to discover that universal principle which connects not only the most distant regions of space but the most remote periods of duration you see the thinking in india was not like newton it did not have some permanent loss <clears throat> and the lagrange to trace through the immensity of both is most subtle and complicated operations okay wonderful certainty and precision the rules still more artificial and ingenious you please note the word artificial for them the rules of the indians used were artificial and ingenious extremely simple so nearly exact it is extraordinary but he said this is his criticism the brahmins follow its rules without understanding its principles they don't have, they give no theory <laughs> they satisfied with calculation that is true actually that is also true his uh, his criticism of the brahmins was also correct we must admit that <clears throat> now however things are changing once again and i however today i would say today with fast computers and so on and so forth i come back to that later on once again we would say well the indians were computational positivists they believed in computation and that if you did it you could actually get results you had to be clever of course about it and you had to have your methods and you had to make observations very important but through computing now till recently that would have been said would have been said that uh, well doesn't take you very far you have to make new laws think about them and so on but now with the big buzz about artificial intelligence and machine learning and so on some people are beginning to think a little differently i want to come to that as well a little later well the greek buzzwords i i won't spend too much time axiom proof theorem perfection beauty logic models universalism this is what you find in the greek literature if you look at indian literature prayojana upaya yukti tantra anumana ganita nyaya tarkanita dirgunita and so on darshana siddhanta samskara you see correction revision tuning siddhanta is a processed conclusion dirgunita is a identity of seen and computed and so on the, the terminology is very different what they are looking for is very different <coughs> and so on upaputti is demonstration etc so you can see that is actually very different now we come to modern okay today <coughs> well let's go back about a 100 120 50 years 140 years there was a big movement in europe this movement was called a movement of positivism um, logical positivism that is what it was called basically it wanted to define science it said as you can see there that it relies only on data of experience facts data you must have data number one no metaphysical speculation nothing about god nothing about scriptures you see they don't enter into the debate at all into consideration at all all more knowledge must be based on positive data of experience fact okay i am reminded of one of bhartrari's words where he says everything depends only on swanubhuti which you are experience you, you must be careful about that beyond facts you use only pure logic or pure mathematics pure logic or pure mathematics logic was still very much there so that is that is their greek inheritance theology and metaphysics are irrelevant animistic anthropomorphic explanations folklore is ruled out first cause ultimate reality shun please don't bring all of those things here <laughs> must be pure logic pure mathematics and pure facts nothing else it went on for quite some time but in india 
they were roots of a somewhat similar thinking, although not exactly the same. And I want to see because there's a, there's a, there's a feeling in India that um, you know religion, God, and so on are very important. They're, uh, uh, they're of course our daily life, and there are strict rules about it. Used to be at least whether we follow them or not now. Um, but even the Indians, as I've told you, when it came to astronomy or science, they did not want to appeal to God. It's not only astronomy. It's the same thing in Ayurveda. If you root Charaka, he doesn't want to do having to do with anything with God. He also says, there's a Daiva. You can I said there are three kinds of Ayurveda. One is called Daiva, going after God, pilgrimage religion. That's not what I'm doing. I'm doing the Ayurveda according to Yukti. That's, that's what he says. Human intelligence, human intelligence. But the same people might have gone ahead and did their pujas and visited temples and so on. They were not religious. But they said science has nothing to do with it. That was the major thing. And so here is um, Bhaskara's invocatory verse. And it has two meanings. One, well maybe three sometimes it said. On one, the black ones and the other ones. You see, the, um, you may interpret it as God or, as I say in the first line, the Lord of Algebra. The Lord of Algebra is what he is talking about. Okay. Avyakta Isha. Lord of the Isha is Lord, let's say. And Avyakta is what is not known or the unknown variable. Is the unknown variable in algebra. So it may be uh, that unknown variable, the Lord of Algebra, or the invisible Lord, mathematicians, Sankhya philosophers, creator of intelligence, guided by wise man, spirit, and the only source of all that is Vyakta. Vyakta is arithmetic or the manifest universe. So the objective of algebra is to take an Avyakta variable, unknown, okay, not expressed, make it a Vyakta variable, and then you can do your arith arithmetic. So that was the way that he describes his book. I just want to give you some Sankhya thoughts. Sankhya is a very old philosophy, Upanishadic times. And most of us don't know much about them. Um, we read the other Upanishads and so on, but we don't read the Sankhya philosophies very much. But they had uh, extraordinary ideas. <coughs> Take the very first one, the first one in my list. Navastu, Navastu Siddhi. Nothing material can arise from the non material. <laughs> well, we still love people magicians, holy men and so on, who produce nothing out of something, something out of nothing. Okay, so the Sankhya said, no, no, that <laughs> is not possible. Not that point, not that point, inappropriate to imagine or postulate unnecessary entities. Do it with the minimum number. Do they believe in God? Their answer is, there is no evidence. <laughs> we don't know whether there is God or not. Let's not bring it into the debate. That's almost positivism, you see. That's a kind of positivism. And here is, uh, once again, we go back to Aryabhata. This is uh, one of the last verses in his book. I will uh, read the translation. From the ocean of real and unreal, I will dredge these gems of knowledge that he has in his book. Okay, he thinks quite highly of what he has got. Sailing the boat of my own mind is very, is very necessary for him to say my own mind, important. What's come in my brain? Which, however, was the gift I got from God? That's the only way that God is mentioned. He gave me a brain, but all of this is done by me. He doesn't invoke God in any other way. <coughs> Now, somebody, has, Nilikan, one of Nilikanta's students asked about the meaning of that verse of uh, Aryabhata. What did he mean by that? And he's telling his, see, he's telling his student, if you tell it, you don't understand what he's saying. When he invokes Brahma, <coughs> the result is, is the cause of Aryabhata's mental clarity, not that Brahma himself came down and told 
the secrets to Aryabhata. He only gave him his mind. <coughs> well, I think the 20th century begins to raise issues once again, and I conclude with what I say here. In the early part of the 20th century, <coughs> many doubts began to crop up. First of all, there were all these the revolutionary theories, relativity, quantum mechanics, uncertainty, there may be more than one solution. I think it can be a particle or a wave. These were not, with this logic or not, that was a big problem. Karl Popper brought this uh, idea of falsifiability, which is what you should have. <coughs> and now nuclear enjoyment and so on. But the most interesting thing of them is Gödel's theorem on logic. Kurt Gödel, a brilliant German mathematician, <coughs> He proved by logic that there are truths that can't be proved by logic. So it's, it's an extraordinary thing. <coughs> he, of course, was in fact a very great logician, very powerful one. But um, he did not believe that logic showed everything. There was another philosopher, uh, I forget his name, uh, it's there in my mind, but I can't immediately recall it, who said logic is actually platitude. After all, if you say this implies this, you're carrying no information about what is implied. It's, it's the same thing, the content, the, the real content is no different. So, <coughs> so he said there are truths not provable logic. And in fact, logical positivism, and he said the system is not complete. It faded out uh, from Europe by the middle of the 20th century. And there were various people who earlier looked at uh, logical positivism and so on. Uh, they were criticized for doing things which were imaginary. Do atoms exist? Well, that famous chemist asteroid said it's a useful fiction or lie. I don't care whether it exists or not. It's easy, easy for you to make calculations. Boltzmann wrote down the equations for the kinetic theory of gases. And these equations had molecules hitting each other. But people didn't believe in molecules at that time. They said, nobody knows about molecules. What is it you are making all these imaginary equations about them? The criticism was so severe that poor Boltzmann committed suicide in a, within a year of those accusations. But uh, funnily, that year, the, the next year, this Frenchman discovered Brownian motion and showed that it were molecules hitting particles which he was seeing under his microscope. So poor, poor man had, been, had, had taken his life the previous year because he had been under such great criticism. And of course there are other more modern things. Now I want to say that the Indians followed a positivism and I hope I have given you enough to think about what positivism was and what their attitudes were. But it was, uh, by and large, it considered number, algebra, calculus, calculus also. Calculus also came naturally in the Kerala school. That this was the more important thing. So, uh, defining characteristics are that it confines itself to the data of observation. You remember what Nilkanta said, experience. And the computational procedures or algorithms that yield agreement with observation. It rejected a priori models of theories, a priori models of theories, because that's a bit like metaphysics. So they didn't make, you don't find those axioms and so on in Indian work. Yeah. Well, so, that the computational positivism, I am arguing here, that is all the properties of uh, positivism. And uh, while it is to be distinguished from Aristotelian or Western logic, without any commitment to views in the scriptures or to anything like the Greek insistence on a notion of the perfect. So, all the defining characteristics of a positivist philosophy centered around no more than observation of facts and computation, with only the logic inherent in the use of numbers to be distinguished from all of this. 
Um, well, the old Greek axioms, um, sometimes it was full of, full of problems. They proved things which were which were known to be untrue. <laughs> But if you make the right axiom, you can always make the axiom which will give you the result you want, or you're looking for. For example, somebody proved that the moon was half the size of the earth, and so on, till by the time of Francis Bacon in England, when they began to see that the East was doing better, which they realized, in fact. When the East was doing better, the numbers had come, algebra was coming, Bacon, Bacon ridicules the Greeks. He said, they're quacks. They use a very strong language, amazingly strong language. They're quacks, he said. This works, works. But all the time, full of only words, he says. And he uses many other adjectives too, many of them. But uh, in India, Ganita, this, this is where we fell down. We were weak, we were weak. Vastly underestimated the potential power and universality if using model with algorithm. This is what led to Newtonian mechanics, and so on. So, well, I'll sketch all of this. No, I, I, I should show you this first one. Today, in modern physics, there are only one modern physics, or are there different ways of doing physics? Well, you go to Feynman. Uh, this is Feynman. Feynman here and Dirac here are going on the Caltech campus. I was there when <laughs> one time when they had arrived there. And um, they are having a debate. The debate goes back to these views. You can see two, two schools of thinking in the West. Dirac said, it is more important to have beauty in one's equations than to have them agree with experiment. He was following Plato. You <laughs> see, beauty, symmetry, perfection is what matters. My equations are smarter than me, he said. So therefore, it should be in some sense true. That's, that's what he's saying. But if you ask Feynman, he said, worship the phenomenon, not the explanation. In other words, give, give due place to observation. I don't tell nature what to do. Nature tells me I'm not going to impose my ideas. I find out from her what it is. A very great deal more truth can be, sorry, a very great deal more truth can become known than can be proven. This is once again showing the limits of logic. He's getting a little closer to the Indian view. Well, let me skip all the rest. I don't want to. Yeah. I want to conclude with what this uh, Russian mathematician has said. Uh, in the name of Satan, Professor at the Leningrad State University. He, may, he gave a lecture. He's written, of course, and many others. He gave a lecture um, <coughs> around the uh, 1980s uh, before, uh, before I did an in Germany, an IEEE uh, conference. It's available as a Springer book. This first paragraph is what I have put there. He was a, he was a pure mathematician. Okay. But he had doubts about pure mathematics. So over a period, his mind gets converted. And that is, he starts the lecture by converting how his mind has actually changed. This is a story of how I changed my views from the belief that good knowledge must always be represented as a set of logical statements. That's the way it's been brought up. That is most what mathematics should do. Within a suitable mathematical model of reality, to my present opinion, that is to say he has changed, changed from these views, views from these, to my present opinion, that knowledge is basically algorithmic. Uh, that's what the Indians have been saying all along. That's what they said uh, nearly 2,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago. Number you see, <coughs> knowledge is basically algorithmic, calculation, algebra, algorithms. It occurred to me that mathematical questions may be no more meaningful than questions asked about characters in some novel. 
what do we really represent in terms of nature? If you don't know that, well then, it's like any novel. So when he said all of that, and told the physicists that, they reacted with sympathy. <laughs> and they said, well, but mathematics are opposing the level of physics. So they said, you're welcome, become a physicist. <laughs> I'll stop there. Thank you very much. So it can change.